Thank you so much for joining us. I would like to take a few minutes to introduce to you our speaker this evening. And uh, once I do that, I'll step away and he'll come to the podium. So with that, let me start by saying that Dr. Michael Sullivan is here with us this evening. With extensive experience in the field of healthcare, Dr. Sullivan has gained a wealth of knowledge from a variety of clinical, administrative, and executive leadership positions. Beginning his career as an orderly with St. Joseph Hospital in Houston, he progressed from serving as an RN staff nurse to an administrative director, a chief operating officer for an acute care facility, and vice president for a healthcare region. Dr. Sullivan currently serves as an assistant professor at the University of St. Thomas in Houston within the PB School of Nursing and the School of Education and Human Services, where he teaches in the undergraduate, graduate, and doctorate levels. Dr. Sullivan holds a doctorate and a Master of Arts in Bioethics and Health Policy from Loyola University Chicago, Stritchman School of Medicine, a Master of Science from University of Houston, Clear Lake, and a Bachelor of Science from University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston. In addition, he is board certified as a healthcare ethicist, consultant, and fellow in the American College of Healthcare Executives. Dr. Sullivan has authored several diverse research articles responsive to healthcare advocacy, community health, and clinical organizational ethics. Additionally, he served on the City of Houston Anti-Human Trafficking Council and is active in numerous professional associations, community boards, and volunteer services, including volunteering his time to come up here to the UST Max Center this evening to uh, speak with us. And so with that, I'd like to uh, ask you to join me in welcoming to the podium, Dr. Michael Sullivan. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to um, explore and address care of the community that has been sponsored by the University of St. Thomas and begin at a 30,000 foot level and then begin to descend from 30 to 20 to 15 to 10 to five to ground level. So um, and if, you, if there's any questions, we'll certainly be happy to, to answer them or attempt to answer them if I don't know. So let's start at the very beginning. We always have to have, have learning objectives and appreciations. So uh, I wish for you at the end of this to gain an appreciation of the University of St. Thomas commitment to our healthy communities, to understand how we might provide and improve access to healthcare services within our local community, especially Houston and the surrounding areas and the importance of us as a Catholic faith-based university to embrace the call to, to those who live in poverty and other vulnerable populations, and also to address heightened community building activities. So let's begin with our faith tradition. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And I don't know if we have any biblical scholars in the room, so, as I certainly am not. But I know from the Hebrew scriptures, from the prophets, and into the New, New Testament with the four writers, into the Acts of the Apostles, and Jesus himself, serving others and providing justice to those in need is mentioned over 2,000 times. So our mission, vision, and values at the university include that we were founded in 1947 in the heart of Houston and are currently celebrating our 74th year in commitment to the city. We are the only Catholic-based, faith-based hospital in or this university in Houston. We are committed both to our intellectual and traditions of both faith and reason, and at times can be, there could be a tension between the two. We pursue excellence in teaching, our scholarship, and promote and instill within our students the core values that have been bequeathed to us 
by our founders, the, the Bazillion Fathers, and work in collaboration with our community partners. Our core values are, are defined in four sections, goodness, discipline, knowledge, and community that have been handed on to us by our Brazilian fathers, our sponsors. And tonight what I would like to address is our fourth value of community and how we build relationships that transform lives, our university, and the world in which we are centered. So if we look at it from a 30,000 foot perspective, the University of St. Thomas is dedicated to a mission of enhancing community health. And in partnership with our School of Nursing, we are committed in providing excellent compassion and caring for the whole person in order to enhance and create communities of health. Now health is not a mere absence of illness. It is a presence or a presence of, of physical health. If we look at it from a community service perspective, health is a much broader field. We are addressing issues such as employment, literacy, education, access to food, things of that nature, which define health in a larger perspective. And the way that we are involved in community is delivering direct health care working in concert with other healthcare providers or faith-based institutions, advocating on behalf of the poor and those who are found on the margins and providing community benefit and services. And why do we do this? Our faith calls us that any, <clears throat> the litmus test for any faith tradition is always the same question. What did you do for the poor? And everybody needs to realize that no one has ever become poor by giving. If we look back at from a historical perspective, we see from the very beginning that the great philosopher as Aristotle once stated and shared, to serve others and to do good is the essence of life. And we wish to make a significant impact in the way that people live by creating and providing community benefits through the establishment of healthy communities. In our mission, we realize that working for justice within the University of St. Thomas not only means pursuing individual dreams, but laboring as companions within our mission. We believe that a social fabric must be worn and woven in partnership with all who serve the community and we honor the relationships and the collaborations with our partners that we have established. Our faculty, staff, and students have all been invited to participate in our community initiatives. And in so, they affirm their belief for justice, service of the poor, and also striving to live authentic faith-filled lives, which lend an opportunity to provide human services and promote social change within our city of Houston. Inspired by the Gospels, we have, been, we have grown spiritually through our interactions with one another and those in need. We acknowledge that respect for values, including the dignity of the human person, and being responsible in the resources that have been entrusted to us in order to serve our community and for them to benefit. Community service calls us individually to a personal change in order to change the world. Now, through our community initiatives, there have been good days, there have been mediocre days, there's been challenging days, but we always hold on to the promise, I am always with you, and to recognize the presence of Christ in those we serve. In working in different community services, our faculty and staff have learned a very valuable lesson. Those who are the recipients of our care have taught us they do not wish to hear a sermon. They want to see a sermon. And as long as there are people in need, Christ will walk the earth as our neighbor. And I've come to realize over the years 
that no one person is responsible for forwarding the mission of the university to its fulfillment, and that we acknowledge that it is our humanness that binds us and strengthens us and keeps us on the, way, on the, on the journey in order to be dedicated to the promotion of justice in the service of our faith. We have a significant number of talented faculty, students, and staff who commit themselves on a daily basis to serve others. By serving others, we provide tools for them to enhance their and empower them and to advocate on, be on behalf of themselves and others and also to acknowledge the worth and respect that each person deserves. For example, in one of the clinics that we were sponsoring, I understood initially that the clinic was totally free. And I said, so what does that entail? And I was informed um, a health assessment, a prescription, any ancillary or support services needed, and the pharmacy would fill the prescription for 90 days and it was free of charge. And I said, can I ask a question why we're, there's no charge? And they said, because we're serving the poor. And I said, okay, but I bet the poor knew they were poor before you knew they were poor. And I said, one of the things of affirming dignity towards another is often asking them to participate in the care that they're receiving. And oftentimes we raise their level of dignity by asking them to make a contribution. And studies have shown that oftentimes when you give something away for free, it doesn't have a value associated to it. And at times can become interpreted as um, an issue that is warranted. Studies have shown if you give a patient a prescription without any type of monetary donation, they are less apt to take the prescription versus an individual that has provided a financial donation are more apt to continue to take the medication. So they just put their, this little skin in the game and it also enhances their dignity because as I found out over the years, 99.99% .99 of people don't want a handout, they wish for a hand up. Mm. So it's a way to enhance the esteem of those we serve within our community. And we also have a specific dedicated cause to serve the poor and the powerless and those who experience catastrophic illnesses. A special concern must be shown towards the, <clears throat> the elderly and for children, especially the, elderly, the children as they begin their life's journey and also the elderly for the wisdom they have shared with us throughout the years. And in our services towards others, we have assured that we're gonna direct our efforts <laughs> to always provide compassion that restores life and to create an environment where quality services are never narrowed by conditions. Over the last year and a half, we've been very successful within the university to establish partnerships with 18 local community affiliates who share common values and in some particular instances, share our same mission and faith traditions. We need to remember what we're working with within the community and when we touch people's lives, for us never to forget that perhaps maybe we have become the lighthouse for that individual who's experiencing a storm. Community initiatives that the university has participated in over the last year would include administering in excess of 400 vaccines to our sponsors, the Brazilian Fathers, our faculty, staff, and the community at large for providing undocumented immigrants living over the Archdiocesan St. Michael's home with lessons in English, reading, and arithmetic, and also offering these students and these immigrant children the opportunity to spend a day at the university and interface with the students and the faculty. 
We've also provided it over at uh, care at Casa Juan Diego with flu vaccines and currently looking at opportunities to administer COVID vaccines. At Angela House in, in uh, Southeast Houston, cooking lessons were initiated by the students, but then expanded services to secure medical, dental, and vision services from a woman re recently released from incarceration. And we'll, I'll discuss a little bit further about that. We also have provided a video for the clients over at San Jose Clinic in English and Spanish addressing management of diabetes. Transferring over to St. Dominic's Village, which is a retirement facility. We participated in healthcare, but also coordinated health screenings because oftentimes elderly members are isolated due to hearing loss. We've extended out to Fulshire by providing elderly clients with early stages of dementia, working on memory books to trigger past events that they can recall with pleasure. And also providing and working at the Houston Food Bank in the washing, just boxing and distributing in excess of a million pounds over a nine, nine week period. <clears throat> We offer services over at Covenant House by providing new mothers the care of their infants and have also assisted young adults at Covenant House in completing employment applications, provided an educational opportunity in collaboration with CHI St. Luke's in January addressing the scourge of human trafficking, which affects 315,000 men, women, and children in the state of Texas and Houston is the number one city of traffic and also are working with our Brazilian fathers in order to assist them in accessing affordable health care for their retired members. We have partnered with the Houston Food Bank that on a monthly basis food distribution for our local community members is available on the university campus and provided our faculty, staff and students of the community at large 1,800 COVID tests at no charge and have now secured on-campus testing, which is available seven days a week from nine to five, and are currently collaborating with CHA Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center in administering COVID vaccines for our local Houston community members at Texas Southern University and Rice University. So at the Houston Food Bank, our students work for a period, once a week for a period of nine weeks in order to begin to address food insecurities and food deserts and the number of inadequate, the number of Houstonians who experience inadequate nutrition on a daily basis and brought them to a greater appreciation of the need to continue to serve. Angela House, was founded approximately 20 years ago by a Dominican sister by the name of Sister Maureen O'Connell. And prior to her decision to enter the Dominican community, she served as a police officer in the city of Chicago. So years ago, it was Sister, the former Maureen O'Connell would prosecute, arrest and have prosecuted women who were accused of prostitution or drug utilization. And afterwards had a conversion of heart and said these women need to be cared for, rehabilitated and mainstreamed back to society. And I don't know if anybody is aware of the behavior that occurs upon discharge from the Houston jail downtown, but oftentimes men and women are discharged approximately two o'clock in the morning in a back alley of the, of the jail. If they have chronic disease, they are not managed from an outpatient perspective. They're not given prescriptions because basically we're finished and fend for yourself. Angela House provides a resource and a respite for these individual women. They apply to come to Angela House. They can stay from a period of 30 days to three years, depending on, on their transition and following the program. Oftentimes they are 
they have a felony against them secondary to prostitution or, or drug abuse. But when you understand their story, when you ask them their story, you understand, you're, you're thankful they're still alive. Angela House has a great, great program and reduces recidivism rate back to the jails by 97%. Um, when here for we gifted Anna meals or part of the Meals on Wheels um, during our flu shots, we don't ever ask for a financial donation for a flu, uh, flu shot administration. But we ask our faculty, staff, and students in the community to provide certain um, items as defined by the ministry that we are going to provide them to. So we decided to um, gift Meals on Wheels with animals and raised over 900 pounds of pet food and toys so that when they deliver the meal to the senior or homebound, they will be able to have enough food for themselves rather than sharing their limited resources with their four-legged friends. In concert with CHI St. Luke's, um, we are working diligently in providing COVID vaccines, but also our students are experiencing a life-changing mission to become the compassion of God to those that they serve. So we follow after God's only heart and the significant question that I pose to you or statement is, I'm really not interested in whether any of us stood with the great. The more important question to stay or statement is to be interested in whether you sat with the broken. And each day I'm reminded that God continually asks in every age and place, whom shall I send? In effect, God asked the tragic fact within our community. How will we address the tragic fact within our community that five, over 500,000 men, women, and children experience hunger here in Houston, inadequate income and lack of development? How do we begin to keep our community safe and not turn to violence just to address disputes? And how do we address the growing problem of addiction and mental illness how do we eradicate the pandemic plight of human trafficking? How will our society end continuing prejudice, overcome hostilities towards refugees? How do we offer real choices and financial resources in obtaining quality education and decent housing? And how can we help the growing numbers of families obtain affordable, accessible health care? And I don't have the answers. It just seems overwhelming and daunting. And sometimes you just tell yourselves, it's too much, we can't address it, it's beyond us and our resources. And sometimes you walk away with your head down because you feel that you can't do anything. But I've learned over time, when we think it's too late, God will always whisper to you, I still have a plan. And when I feel that way, I ask myself, so do you mind sharing with me what the plan is? And the plan was simply this. It's right in front of you. Just open your eyes. And I realized that each day our faculty, staff, and students will generously answer, here I am, send me. It is a miraculous work to be hold for all of us. And with that, I wish to thank you. Does anybody have any questions, comments, something we can help you with? So we have one question. Uh -huh. um, how does USC Math envision helping the community in Montgomery County? Take that yeah, you, can, you can take that question. <laughs> Whatever we have is yours. <laughs> and can be replicated. First of all, thank you, Dr. You're Sullivan, welcome, you're welcome. for sharing those thoughts with us tonight. And um, in particular, all the examples of how the University of St. Thomas is currently serving the, a very large community uh, in and around Houston. And, uh, you know, I, I found it to be inspirational and thought-provoking as to how we can take the university's example of serving uh, 
um, you know, caring for the community and serving with gladness into our own personal lives. True. But to address the question specifically that was asked about how we here at the UST Max Center uh, plan to serve the, the Montgomery County community, the timing of that question is very interesting because it reflects a conversation that we were having here actually just earlier today. We were talking about wanting to, uh, well, there's, let me back up for a second. At the university, we have what um, we call the Celts Day of Service. The Celts, that's our uh, university mascot. And so there's an annual Celts Day of Service, and that takes us out into the, the greater Houston community to do any number of things. We were just today discussing our desire to bring the Celts Day of Service program here so that we can administer that opportunity directly out of the UST Max Center. And we know those of you, yeah, thank you, Lorena, yes. And we would love for you to come and join in on that. We know that there is a great need. We've already partnered here with the Montgomery County uh, Food Bank. We partnered with them during their holiday giving time or their food drive for the holidays. And we look forward to partnering with them on an ongoing basis. And so that would be a really great uh, avenue for us to take. We're also interested in uh, build projects, you know, like Habitat for Humanity, for example. But we are interested and open to other ideas where we can not only invite our uh, UST alumni that live in this area, but our current students and all of our, our great friends within the community, such as you guys, to join in on that and get out there into the community and do some good. Yeah, thank you for that question. You're welcome. Any other questions for Dr. Um, Sullivan? Hey, Father Pat. Hey, Dr. Sullivan, I just want to thank you for uh, the presentation as an alum of uh, UST. It's, it's oh. really exciting to see the uh, the good work you're doing. You know, you, you posed a lot of challenges there, right? A lot of open-ended questions. And um, yeah, you know, the concern continues to how are we, especially in today's environment, going to uh, to address all of those, all those needs. And I'm, I'm glad Lorena asked about the, uh, uh, here in Montgomery County, I'm up here at St. Simon and Jude here in the Woodlands. And, oh, yes. you know, uh, we, we, we really have, you know, we have all those needs up here. And, you know, one of the things we're finding is we don't have a, a Catholic presence in, in really serving those needs here. Um, you know, and so it's, it's good to, to see that maybe we'll have some expansion of that here into Montgomery County. So thank sure. you. Consider it done. One of the things I've learned over the years is when there's, an, there's a need or there's a project that, that needs to be addressed. A lot of times people want to do good. They just don't know what to get involved in. And if you invite them to the table, they usually come. They usually come, you know? So I always just extend a hand and say, why don't you come and see how, what this is all about, see if you might have an interest in it. When we were when I was in healthcare per se in the in the, uh, the regional position, uh, we were operating a clinic for the non-resourced uh, and those on the margins. But there were certain things you could do in the clinic, and there were certain things that needed to be referred to the hospital. For example, if you had a, an individual with a, a large hernia, or they had some type of cyst that needed an incision and drainage, and um, so I bartered with our medical staff. And I said, if, I, if, you, if you'll take one of our non-resource patients once a year, I won't bother you again for another year because they didn't want to be overwhelmed and overtaxed. And I understand that. I understand that. And so I had over 500 physicians that were available at my disposal. So I called, we had a, um, we had a, 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 an adult patient that came in that had a large umbil umbilical hernia. And so I called um, one of our surgeons, I called him Dr. Watson, and he said, sure, I'll take care of him, make sure the hospital's in agreement. And so the patient went over and had his hernia repair. And then approximately, maybe it was seven months later, I had a child that came in, an adolescent, he had a large cyst, 
And uh, I said, no, we need to refer this to a surgeon. So I called him again and he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. You said one a year. I said, yes. He goes, this is the second one. I said, I didn't tell you how I'm counting, how I'm counting years. These are dog years. We're up to seven years. And he said, all right, all right, just set them over, set them over. But um, what the challenge is, is just begin to extend the invitation to people. Our faculty has been most welcoming. The students become very enthusiastic about it. And we're benefiting the community, extending our mission, and fulfilling it day by day. So, Father, if there's anything we can do for you at, at, here in, um, in Conroe or at the main campus, you just let us know. Yeah, I definitely want to continue that dialogue, right? Uh, like I said, the needs are big. And, yeah, the needs are big, and, but we start small. We start small. And it's very important to ask the community what's important to them first. Because they're the stakeholder, they're the recipient. And they'll tell us, they'll tell us. We just have to ask. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, so this time, this time I may speak. Um, what uh, what Father uh, Pat was saying is, is is very timely. He was instrumental in getting our immigration clinic off the ground um, and up and running. And what we realized after holding the monthly clinic at uh, St. Simon and Jude. Uh, for about four or five months, right, Father Pat, was that people were not coming. And I finally asked people why they were not coming. They said that it was because it was on a Sunday and they feel comfortable driving through the woodlands on weekdays, but not on weekends. So we ended up just moving uh, the clinic to Conroe. Uh, but what we want to do uh, is help the community wherever the community wants to meet us. Uh, so, you know, if there is anything that we can do, and when I say we, I did um, put on the chat a, a flyer. It's a collaborative of churches, of parishioners, of lawyers, uh, nonprofits in Montgomery County, and it is just helping people. Uh, with immigration questions because there's a vacuum in Montgomery County when it comes to free or low cost uh, help when it comes to immigration issues and everybody has to go to Houston or uh, ends up not knowing you know what to do and they get stuck in that you know we're not doing anything so I, we've identified the great need and also a bunch of us immigration attorneys prefer not to have to volunteer in Houston because some of us work Monday through Friday in Houston, have to go to court to Houston. So it, it is more comfortable for us to, uh, to provide assistance to people from our community while we stay in our community. Completely understandable. Okay, we have a question from the chat. It says, you stated that people that are given care for free see no value in the gift and may not make use of the care or prescription. How do you address this? Uh, I have personal experience from that. Um, my mother, God rest her soul, she wore hearing aids for a number, number of years. And I would go over on the weekends or during the week to visit with her. And so I, was, I spoke to her and she kept telling me, I can't hear you, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. And I said, well, where are your hearing aids? And she said, they both broke. And I said, okay, well, we can't maintain this relationship by me screaming at you. We need to get these hearing aids replaced. And she said, I have to wait until next month when the check comes in. And I said, well, we can't wait a month because with loss of hearing, people become isolated very quickly. So I looked at it and Father God, you might need to help me on this one because it was a sin, but I looked at it from the ethical principle of benefit versus burden. And I said, okay, I'm going to decide. I'm going with the benefits, so I'm going to lie. So I told my mother that hearing aids were covered under Medicare. And she goes, so when did that happen? I said, I think it was about a month ago because I got a flyer at work about it. She goes, really? I didn't get anything in the mail. It's like, I don't know. Let's get the appointment taken care of. 
So we went to the audiologist's office. My mom's in the, uh, the hearing booth having her hearing test. I'm speaking to the audiologist and I said, Medicare covers hearing aids, right? And she goes, no, they don't. I said, you know that, I know that. But I want, my mother doesn't know that. So please ask her for her Medicare card. And here's my credit card. So I was charged $6,000 for two hearing aids. And she could hear anything. Okay. Story continues. About eight weeks later, on one of our evening conversations, I said, well, how was your day? Well, it wasn't very good. And I said, well, what does that mean? Well, I, I can't find my hearing aids. What? And I started yelling, well, you better find them. And she goes, I don't know what you're getting so upset about. The government will pay for them. No, they don't. No, they don't. I said, one time in a lifetime, that's it. And you need to just have a little ownership because it, oftentimes in those kind of circumstances, if I lose this, if I don't get this, I can just go back and get it again. And it, I think it's very important in our, in our relationships with each other that there is a relationship and there's a partnership with one goal to enhance your health. And in participating, I think sometimes you need to make some type of contribution so that we're on equal playing fields. That's what it means. That's, does that help? Now, will I turn somebody away because they can't afford it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But a lot of times they're never asked. And I believe it's a way of enhancing and recognizing one dignity too. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. And, uh, You're so welcome. welcome for sharing that with us. Um, thank you all for being here with us tonight for the, our inaugural luminary lecture. We appreciate you being a part of the UST Max Center world, and we invite you to come down to our micro campus, as Brenda said, at uh, any time that you wish. It would be our pleasure to have you here. Thanks again, Dr. Sullivan, for your, your, your interesting uh, presentation for us here this evening. Very thought provoking and uh, pulled a little bit at the heartstrings, I think. So we appreciate you so much. Have a wonderful evening and come back and see us. Good night, everyone.